Good morning, everyone, and welcome all you to the first technical session of the 33rd PGIA Annual Congress. The theme of the session is stakeholder behavior in agricultural process. So let me first introduce you to the chairperson and the judges. So the chairperson of this session is Professor Abdulek Naika. Sir, it's a pleasure and a privilege for me to introduce you to the session. Professor Atulek Naika is a professor in accounting and he's attached to the Department of Business Finance, Faculty of Management, University of Peradeniya. Currently, he serves as the Dean of the Faculty. So in addition to serving in different capacities at the university, Professor Ekanayaka is uh, the president of the Association of Candy Chartered Accountants and the vice president of the Sri Lanka Finance uh, Association. And let me introduce the judges of this panel. So we have three judges. So we have uh, Dr. BMK Pereira, former director, career guidance unit at University of Peradeniya. And we have Dr. Komudu Jayavadana. She's a senior lecturer attached to Department of Management Science, Faculty of Management, Uwe University. And we have Dr. Thalatarat Naika. She's a former additional director general, livestock uh, development, Department of Animal Production and Health. For these sessions, we have six presentations and I would like to in, uh, I welcome all our presenters and the audience. So without further ado, let me invite the chairperson, Professor Ekenaika, to chair the sessions. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pradeepa. Uh, once again, uh, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, I also uh, welcome you for the 30, uh, 33rd Annual Congress of the PGIA and also for the technical session one stakeholder behavior in agricultural process. And uh, today we got uh, six uh, presentations. Uh, before um, I invite the first presenter, uh, let me brief um, to you on um, how uh, each presentation uh, uh, will be arranged. Uh, we have uh, recorded presentations um, and uh, the maximum uh, time that we have allowed for the presentation is 12 minutes followed by three minutes uh, discussion uh, uh, is given. I hope uh, all the presenters uh, are available uh, uh, to respond uh, for the questions. Now, um, uh, the, the audience, uh, if you have any uh, question, you can uh, use the uh, chat box uh, given in Zoom uh, to, uh, to raise your question. And also uh, the, the judges, um, if you have, uh, uh, I'm sure you might have uh, questions. Uh, so if you have questions, please use the raise uh, hand option and then uh, we will uh, come to uh, take your question. So with that uh, brief introduction, uh, let me uh, now move to the uh, first uh, presentation uh, today. Uh, uh, the title of uh, the, uh, the uh, research uh, is uh, Dietary Diversity Among Adolescents uh, age 11 to 13 in the city of Columbus, Sri Lanka, quoted by ADDC Athaud, DGNG Vijay Singh, and GAP Chandrasekhar. The presenter is uh, ADDC Athaud. So we will now play the, uh, the uh, video of the presentation. Now I'm going to present the findings of my research on dietary diversity among adolescents aged 11 to 13 years in the city of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Let's move to the introduction. Micronutrient malnutrition remains a public health problem in most developing countries, including Sri Lanka, partly due to monotonous cereal-based diet that lacks diversity. Dietary diversity considered to be a key indicator in assessing the access, utilization, and quality of diet, and is also a proxy for nutrient adequacy of the diet of individuals. Adolescents are more prone for micronutrient malnutrition as they are in phase of accelerated growth and development. 
The city of Colombo is the capital of the country in easing rapid urbanization and nutrition transition in which diet has changed to energy dense diet which lacks micronutrients. Objective. Objective of this study was to determine the dietary diversity of 11 to 13 year adolescents in the city of Colombo. Methodology. A cross-sectional study was conducted using 634 11 to 13 year adolescents who were studying in 12 government schools in the city of Colombo. Subjects were recruited using the multi-stage stratified cluster sampling technique. Straight over administrative district, type of school and school category. Data collection, types, quantities, and method of preparation of foods in two week days and one weekend day, that is during three week consecutive days were gathered using a three day diet diary. Social demographic data, a general questionnaire was used to gather social demographic data on ethnicity, gender, date of birth, family size, level of education of parents, occupation of parents, household monthly income, and living area of the household. Household food security status was determined using USDA 18 item household food security hunger survey module. Anthropometric data on height, weight, and waist circumference were measured according to the standard procedures. Data analysis. Dietary diversity was determined using two indices, that is dietary diversity and food variety score. Dietary diversity score was determined using food and agriculture organization nine food groups. The food groups were starchy staples, dark green leafy vegetables, other vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables, other fruits and vegetables, organ meat, meat and fish, eggs, legumes, nuts and seeds, and milk and milk products. Nutritional status. Nutritional status was determined using three indices, that is height for age, BMI for age, and waist to height ratio. Based on these nutritional indices, subjects were classified as stunted, normal height, wasting, normal weight, overweight, obese, and abdominal obesity present and adolescent, absent adolescents. Food security status. Four levels of food security status as food secure, food insecure without hunger, food insecure with moderate hunger, and food insecure with severe hunger were determined based on the number of affirmative responses gathered for the USDA questionnaire. Statistical analysis. All the statistical analysis were conducted using SPSS version 21 software. Mean dietary diversity score and mean food variety score were calculated. Two independent sample t-test and analysis of variance were performed to determine the differences of mean dietary diversity score and mean food variety score by gender, type of school, administrative district, nutritional status, and household food security status. Let's move to the results. Social demographic characteristics of the subjects. Majority of the subjects were Sinhalese, family size between 5 to 8 members, and household monthly income between 25,001 to 50,000 rupees. <coughs> Majority of the subject, subjects were living household area below 126.45 square meters, that is less than 5 perches. Considering the occupation of the parents, majority of the mothers were unemployed, whereas majority of fathers were self-employed. Considering the level of education of the parents, majority of both mothers and fathers were educated up to advanced level. Mean dietary diversity score was 4.36 and classified as medium dietary diversity. Further, dietary diversity was adequate. Mean food variety score was 9.69. Mean dietary diversity score subjects by gender, type of school, administrative district, nutritional status, and household food security status. The diet of boys was more diverse than diet of girls. 
dietary diversity score among adolescents who were studying in national school was higher than uh, that of the adolescents studying in provincial schools. There was no significant difference in uh, mean dietary diversity score by administrative district and current nutritional status, that is height for age, BMI for age and waist to height ratio. Considering the household food security status, the highest dietary diversity score was reported among adolescents who were food secure and it was 4.61. The lowest Food, uh, the lowest dietary diversity score was reported among adolescents who were food insecure with severe hunger and it was 3.27. The consumption of food groups by the adolescents. All the adolescents consume starchy staples and three-fourths of the adolescents consume meat and fish. Around 65% of the adolescents consume milk and milk products, legumes, nuts and seeds other, and other fruits and vegetables. The consumption of eggs, organ meat, vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables and dark green, dark green leafy vegetables were very low. Mean food variety score of subjects by gender, type of school, administrative district, nutritional status and household food security status. The diet of boys had more food varieties than girls. The food variety score among adolescents who were studying in national school was higher than the, that of the adolescents studying in provincial schools. The highest food variety score was reported in administrative district 3 and it was 10.53. The lowest food variety score was reported in administrative district 1 and it was 8.04. Similar to dietary diversity score, there was no significant difference in food variety score by current nutritional status. That is height for age, BMI for age and waist to height ratio. Considering the household food security status, the highest food variety score was reported in among adolescents who were food secure and it was 10.13. The lowest food variety score was reported among adolescents who were food insecure with severe hunger and it was 6.62. Conclusion, the diversity of the diet consumed by the adolescents age 11 to 13 years in the city of Colombo is adequate and categorized as medium dietary diversity. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sadawde, for your presentation. And now I would like to open up uh, the discussion uh, by moving uh, to um, our judges. Uh, uh, judges, if you have any uh, question to be asked from uh, Ms. Adaud, I think uh, Ms. Adaud is online uh, with us now. Right. Uh, Ms. Adaud, I, I have to ask you a question on uh, the quality of uh, the food that uh, the children consume. Uh, were you at any point concerned about identifying whether the food, what you say is, you know, dietary status is medium when it comes to uh, what they eat and the diversity, a diversity as well as the amount eaten, but consumed. So are there any, are there any differences in, in a very, uh, so, uh, very important items such as, you know, omega-3 fatty acids? Do they eat sufficient? foods with omega-3, containing omega-3 fa fatty acids. I hope you know you, you can hear me well. Chattari, your mic is muted. Can you please unmute? Uh, OK, sir. Uh, when I went through their diet diaries, uh, they had not eat uh, adequate uh, sources of uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Mm. Right. So then, uh, how would you know your, your conclusions was just one line that it was medium. Uh, what do you consider is the take home message to the listener? What can the listener infer from all the, I mean, lot, you, you gave us a lot of information. There was a lot of uh, uh, details given, but what is the take home message? Uh, even though uh, the children in the city of Colombo consume uh, energy dense diet. Uh, the, uh, the dietary diversity uh, is uh, adequate. Uh, that is, they consume uh, 
uh, more food varieties uh, they, uh, which can uh, fulfill their uh, nutrient intake uh, is that is that is that all that you can say from uh, doing this particular research or do you have anything more any recommendations to the government or to the health authorities or to um, the teachers we, in, i yeah. mean you, you, when i say take home message i i i really am focusing on what are the mo what are the most important salient points uh, that emerged out of your research uh, the, i hope you understand me mm -hmm. uh, consumption of vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables was very low. Uh, so I think uh, the uh, responsible authorities to, should take actions to uh, promote uh, vitamin A rich uh, consumption of vitamin A rich foods, uh, foods among those uh, adolescents. Uh, Right. One one last question before I um, stop. Uh, that is, you know, what is the basis of your stratification? This is relating to the methodology. How did you? What are, what is the basis on which you know you stratified your sample? I used uh, administrative district type of school and uh, school category for stratification of subject. Right. Does the school uh, that you select, uh, whether it is a national school or a provincial school, does it have a bearing on the income earning capacity of the parents? When I look at the, uh, the uh, household monthly income of national and provincial schools, uh, the household monthly income was higher among national schools uh, than uh, household monthly income of provincial schools. So the affordability of food, uh, variety of foods is higher among uh, national school adolescents. Than okay. school. I got your point, but I think, you know, it might be rather difficult to infer that um, from, uh, I mean, you can't, I don't think it is fair to generalize just indicating that, you know, your national schools, uh, uh, people have a higher income earning capacity it depends on the respondent. If the, if the respondent indicates that the family income earning capacity is high, then I can understand that. But otherwise, you know, just generalizing would uh, rather be rather difficult. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thank Pedra, you. Yes. Uh, very useful comments. Thank you indeed. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, do we have time to go through another uh, for another? Yes, uh, very quickly, Dr. Talata or Dr. Kumuti, do you have any questions uh, from uh, Ms. Atavada? Okay, so just uh, uh, do you think I can ask a single question? Okay, so it, it's not actually a question, it's just a clarification, I think. Okay, so uh, and when I went through your presentation, I saw that you came up with some uh, categories, like four categories, when you were presenting the, um, the food security status. And I'm just curious to know, and uh, so what is the rationale, uh, how they've been developed by kind of the regulated organizations, or how, and what's the rationale for you to end up with these categories? I'm, I'm just curious to know that short from my end. It was based on the uh, number of uh, affirmative responses for, for the uh, how USDA 18 item questionnaire, if the number of affirmative responses were between, between 0 to 2, they were classified as food secure. Uh, if the number of affirmative responses scored uh, between 3 to 7, they were classified as uh, food insecure without hunger. If the number of affirmative responses were between uh, 8 to 12, they were classified as food insecure with moderate hunger. If the number of affirmative responses were between 13 to 18, they were classified as food insecure with severe hunger. It was based on the severity of uh, food insecurity. The uh, questionnaire was developed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank uh, you. Uh, Ms. Adaud, for your presentation. And thanks, uh, judges, uh, for your very useful uh, uh, comments. Uh, I'm sure they'll be useful for uh, Ms. Adaud to uh, to, to further expand uh, her research. So um, uh, let, uh, that, with that uh, remark, uh, let us move to the second uh, presentation of this session. The title of the presentation is Market Potential for Quality Certified Dried Fish, a Consumer Choice Experiment in the Gold District of Sri Lanka. So this uh, paper is uh, co-authored by M. U. N. Gunavardhana, W. N. D. Silva, and M. Anderson, 
the presenter is M U N Gunabartana and we'll play the record now. Women, I'm Udani Gunavadana presenting the research findings on market potential for quality certified dried fish, a consumer choice experiment in Gold District of Sri Lanka. So here is the flow of the presentation. Let me give you a brief introduction at the beginning. Fisheries sector contributes 1.3% of country's economy, while fish and fish products representing 60% of animal protein intake in Sri Lankan diets. When it comes to the processed fish, dried fish is the most common form of processed fish consumed by Sri Lankans. So, however, Sri Lanka has become one of the main fish and fish product importing country due to the low supply of dried fish to the market. So, in this graph also, you can find out that 37% of fish and fish uh, product imports representing dried fish. So, although there is a lack of local uh, fish, dried fish supply to the Sri Lankan market, local producers have big have faced some problems with marketing. So these uh, producers always sell their products to the wholesalers who visit to their processing sites. So therefore they don't have direct market linkages with the consumers. This leads that producers do not have market information what the actual requirement of the market and also they have no control of uh, requesting a higher price and also they are facing a higher competition with the imported products. So Kotler, the father of marketing says that marketing is just not disposing what you have made. It is art of creating a genuine customer value. So therefore customers plays a very important role in marketing. So in case of dried fish, there are empirical research on dried fish processing, but there is a lack of knowledge on consumer side analysis. Therefore, our research is focused on identifying consumers willingness to pay for quality certified dried fish and what are the attributes they consider and the preference of the consumer for dried fish. The, uh, so the objectives of the study are to estimate the key characteristics considered when purchasing dried fish to explore consumer preference for dried fish. So our methodology, the study was conducted as a consumer uh, survey using structured uh, questionnaires gaining choice cards. Our target population is dried fish consuming households. So meanwhile, we interviewed dried fish processing households in Gaul district. Sampling technique is a two-stage cluster sampling. First cluster is urban, estate and rural sectors. The second clustering is we selected two GN divisions from each cluster. So uh, the total uh, sample size is 180. So choice card methodological approach is the main methodology we use. It is used to uh, identify consumer preference between products. So here you can see uh, Typical example for a choice card, there is a, uh, the consumer is going to purchase in a television and there are some product characteristics. They are called as attributes. For each attributes, there are several levels. So one of this product profile is become an alternative for the consumer. So consumer has to choose between these alternatives. So in order to select the attributes to our choice cards, we, conduct, we have conducted a pre-survey and also in-depth interviews with the expertise in the Department of Fisheries and NARA. So accordingly, we selected three alternatives for a choice card along with the no-buy option and there are nine choice cards uh, for one respondent. So these are the attributes we selected. The first one is origin, under that levels are local and imported dried method, sun dried and oven dried and for the packaging, vacuum packaging, normal packaging and no packaging. For the SLS certification, uh, the availability of SLS and un, uh, whether it is available or not. So there are uh, prices for 100 gram of dried fish. So this is a typical example for one of the choice card we used in our questionnaire. So data were analysis by using Stata and SPSS and Microsoft Excel. So let's move to the results and discussions. So the consumption of dried fish in Gaul district uh, uh, 
respectively urban rural and estate sector average per capita consumption of dried fish is 124 grams 103 grams and 118 grams so the ANOVA test results show that there is no difference in consumption between result sectors so the consumer preference for dried fish we have asked the respondent to rank the first three highest preferred dried fish species accordingly in the urban sector uh, for um, all the first second and third ranks sprats has been selected by the majority and uh, yellowfin tuna also selected by the majority for second and third places and in the rural sector also majority have been selected uh, uh, sprats for all the first second and third places followed by uh, yellowfin tuna and skipjack tuna and in the state tech sector there is a difference majority have been selected sprats for the first place and for the second uh, ranking majority have selected bola or the big ice cats and for the third place majority have selected uh, swordfish or sapphira so then we have analyzed the consumer org organoleptic properties that are considered by the consumers so we have asked smell color texture and appearance of the organoleptic properties what are the organoleptic properties that consumer consider when purchasing so consumers have selected either one or combination of all of these so summary of the results say that uh, smell and appearance are the most pre uh, considered organoleptic properties by the consumers so let's move the results of the choice card experiment we have calculated the marginal willingness to pay for each and every attribute so a conditional logistic regression model was run the dependent variable is consumer's choice and the independent variables are all the levels in the choice card so the reference levels are uh, imported oven dried no packaging and uh, non availability of sls certification for each attribute so results of the conditional logistic regression say that local attribute have become significant all the sectors so positively significant so that that implies that consumers prefer local locally produced dried fish over to imported dried fish and in in case of dry method sun dried have become significant in each and every sector so that says that the positive significance says that consumers uh, prefer sun dried uh, fish over to oven dried fish and in case of back packaging only uh, normal packaging have become negatively significant in a rural and estate sector so therefore this negative significance says that consumer does not prefer uh, packaging over to no packaging and also vacuum packaging have not become significant in any sector therefore there is no clear preference identified through the model in case of quality certification all the uh, sectors quality certification has become positively significant therefore consumers prefer quality certified dried fish over, over to non certified dried fish so the in case of price attribute the estate sector the price attribute have not become significant so this equation was used to calculate the marginal willingness to pay so as the price attribute have not become significant in the estate sector we don't have calculated a marginal willingness to pay for the estate sector so here are the marginal willingness to pay values so in case of locally produced dried fish both urban and rural consumers respectively willing to pay rupees 294 and rupees 251 of extra money comparing to the price of 100 gram of imported dried fish and in case of sun dried they prefer to uh, the consumers are willing to pay an extra amount of money of 237 and 113 rupees for sun dried fish comparing to the price of 100 grams of oven dried fish and this certification is the most important result in the study the consumers are willing to pay a very high amount of 
334 and 326 in urban and rural sectors that is an extra money comparing to the price of 100 gram of non-certified dried fish. So therefore the study concludes that there is a good market potential for spreads in the all the sectors and consumer prefer locally produced sun dried and quality certified fish. So and also the highest mar uh, marginal willingness to pay value is observed for the quality certification therefore consumers are highly concerned on the quality of dried fish. So quality certification plays a vital role in dried fish. Therefore the study suggests that uh, consumer, the producers should be encouraged to be aware and to obtain the quality certifications given by the Sri Lanka Standard Institute. So that's all for the presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ms. Gunavardhan, for your presentation. Uh, before I move to the uh, judges, um, a quick reminder, the audience, if you have any questions, please post uh, your question to the chat box. Um, Dr. Talata, would you like to open up the discussion? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Then, uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Sudhani, I'd like to ask that when she uh, continuously mentioned that the quality of the dried fish what do you mean by that quality of that dried fish? Any? Uh, there's a standard given from the Sri Lanka Standard Institute for the quality yeah. of the dried fish. So they have mentioned that the fish should be washed with the uh, bottle drinking water. That means the pure water and the salt content sh uh, should be 8 to 12% average. Likewise, there's a... Uh, a group of in instructions given by the uh, SLS certificate, SLS Institute, in order to obtain the quality certification for the uh, dried fish producers. So the, they are the specification mainly for the uh, dried fish quality. Yeah. Do you find any any of these products they mentioned those uh, that uh, standards in some way? I haven't seen any. No, actually, uh, uh, in the current uh, situation, there are no any uh, quality certified dried fish in the market. So what we have done is uh, we have asked from the consumers if uh, you have given a quality certified dried fish in the market in the future, would you like to pay and uh, purchase mm -hmm. those quality certified mm -hmm. dried fish? So, that, that is the... Uh, so uh, that is the question uh, that we raise for the consumers. If we have, if the producers are giving you a quality certified dried fish, would you like to pay and purchase that quality certified dried fish? Yeah, one other question can I ask? Then uh, uh, when, when you are that's doing that, you got the three uh, places, estate and urban and the uh, rural. Okay. Uh, do you think that the availability of all these varieties in the same O oh, that's a different? Yeah, that's what uh, we have conducted a hypothetical uh, market uh, experiment. So what we have asked is consumers have to imagine that all these products are available for them to uh, purchase at the market. So they have to hypothetically think that they are in the market to purchase these particular products. And uh, so they have to mark their choices. So our uh, intention was to uh, identify whether all the urban, rural and estate consumers are uh, willing to pay for this quality certification or packaging or whatever. So then we can provide the uh, suggestion for the producers that uh, all in these sectors, people People would like to purchase quality certified dried fish in this sector. People would like to purchase a uh, packaged fish, dried fish likewise. So this uh, choice card experiment was conducted as an hypothetical market choice experiment. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, madam. Thank you. Uh, very useful questions, uh, Dr. Talata. But Dr. Komudi, do you have any questions uh, to ask from Ms. Gunabhadra? <laughs> Uh, the audience, could you please mute your mic? I'll give no corrections. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Perra is experiencing some technical difficulties. Uh, 
Dr. Perra. Uh, yes, I'm. You yes. know, I, I'm having a lot of difficulty connecting uh, with yeah, my. Yeah, but now we, we can hear you clearly. If you can mm. uh, ask questions, yes. Yeah, I'd just like to ask a question uh, from uh, uh, this angle. Now, uh, in a price-conscious uh, society, uh, we are going through a lot of difficulties. Would you Would you rather focus on availability of a product or the quality aspects? currently in Sri Lanka, our normal consumer is more intent on uh, going for cheaper product or quality product? Uh, by my experience, by uh, interviewing the respondents, they are more focused on the quality rather than the price. So however, in this uh, experiment, we have find out some uh, higher marginal willingness to pay uh, for the attributes. So in case of choice card experiments, this overestimation is possible. So it is uh, confirmed from the previous studies as well that uh, overestimation is possible with the choice card experiments because we are giving a hypothetical market experience for the consumers. So they don't have to actually purchase these pr products at the market. So what, are, what they are doing is just imagine and mark their choices. So with that, overestimation is possible with the uh, choice card ex experiment. So that's why we have uh, find, come up with some higher marginal willingness to pay. So however, the consumers are uh, intention was they would like to pay for the higher quality so they are more uh, quality conscious rather than uh, considering the price thank you i think uh, yeah, that's yeah. fine mm -hmm. yeah thanks thanks for all those questions uh, uh, now uh, let us move to the third uh, presentation of our session the title of uh, the presentation is behavioral factors influencing the adoption of Powerface D2 tapping system by smaller smallholder rubber farmers in Monaragal district, co-authored by PKKS Gunaratna, HVA Vikramasurya, MWAP Jayatilaka, and W Vijay Surya. The presenter is PKKS Gunaratna, and uh, so we'll make the uh, the video uh, play. Behavioral factors influencing the adoption of half a spiral, half day tapping system. It's called SDTS by smallholder rubber farmers in Monoragal district. I am Sanjay Gurunanda from Rubber Research Institute of Sri Lanka. Other research members are Dr. Heshan Vikram Surya, Dr. Jai Tilak, and Dr. Vasana Vijay Surya. This is the presentation layout, introduction, research background, research questions, objectives, methodology, research and discussion, conclusion, acknowledgement, and final references. Introduction. Natural rubber, heavy abrasiliasis, is the one of the important plantation sector in Sri Lanka. This is the uh, key socioeconomic factors in last year, 2020. GDP contribution was 0.3. Export earnings, US dollars, $875 million. Not only that, employment generates over 500,000 in the people in the country. When we look at the smallholder rubber sector, it's a key economic role in the country. So there are around 150 smallholders are distributing among the 16 administrative districts in the country. So under this background, Let's see, look at the rubber tabby. Rubber. Rubber is a plantation crop. It has clear immature stage and mature stage. Mature means it gives the latex for people. Well, the tappers. It's called, now the name is changed. It's called uh, latex harvesters. People who uh, extract rubber or latex from the rubber tree by using the tapping knife is called it is harvesters or tapers. It's not a white color job, but it can be considered as the backbone of the industry. This is the initial step of the rubber processing, uh, rubber manufacturing and rubber processing process. So now, research background. Monaragal is the newly rubber introduced area. So people plant rubber, 
now they are in the tapping stage so actually at the beginning stage they don't know how to tap it this is new crop for them so this uh, figures this uh, picture shows that they are initial tapping stage uh, uh, they, 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 they damage rubber plant so however at this situation rubber research of institute RRSL introduced new tapping system for the, this newly introduced area. It's called half a spiral, half day tapping system. That means so done in angle 30 degrees with the horizontal half a spiral in alternate stages. So then after introducing this system, what happened? So after a few years, then the, when you look at the field situation, but it's not the satisfactory level. Why? People are not adapting this tapping system. So not adapting, then partially adapting, but what the reason? So under this background, research questions are identified in this study as why are these small orders are not adapting the SDTS? What are the factors affecting that adapting the SDTS? What are the strategies? How we enhancing the improvement of the adoption of SDTS? Under this research background and research question, main objective of this study to assess the influential behavioral factors of adopting of recommended SDTS developed by the RRSL in the smallholder rubber sector monoragra. To achieve this main objective, two specific objectives. First one, to in investigate the relative contribution of behavioral factors on the level of adoption, SDTS. Then, to develop these strategies for accelerating the adoption of SDTS in the smallholder rubber sector on Ragal, research methodology. Six steps were followed to achieve uh, used as the research methodology in this study. First one is developing the conceptual framework, developing the hypothesis, instrumental development and measurement, also, uh, questionnaire survey to stage modeling process, building process, then finally hypothesis testing. Step one, conceptual framework. According to the uh, decomposed theory of the plant behavior and the literature review and the field condition in the monoragal district. So this conceptual framework was developed. Here, perceived usefulness, perceived easy of use, compatibility, relative advantage, subjective norms, facilitating condition, attitude of the farmers, behavioral intention, perceived behavioral control, those are the variables independent variables uh, and the intermediate variables which are affected to the adoption of SDTS by the smallholder rubber sector in Monorano district. To uh, test that conceptual framework, again, nine hypotheses were developed as shown in this slide. Like this. So then uh, I'm not going to read by each by each. Then the instrument development and measurement. This is important sector of this study. 30 items were developed according to the literature review and the field condition and the experts review uh, to measure the uh, behavioral factors of the small holders in the Mondragal industry. Then pretest interview methods was used. Then uh, five, uh, five point Likert scale uh, from strong is agree to uh, completely strongly agree was used to measure the then behavioral factors items. Step four, pre tested questionnaire. So, by using the stratified random sample technique, uh, 297 small holders were selected as the study sample in Monaragara district. Uh, covering the all rubber growing uh, DS division, eight DS division into 2020. Two stage building process here, test of measure, both test of measurement model and assessment of the structural model was used to assess the two stage model building process to complete the model. Then a smart uh, PLS algorithm and partial least square approach uh, for the structural equation model or PLSC and did the blind forming procedure were applied for the fulfill the two stage uh, model building process. Step six, hypothesis testing. Then 
So data uh, empirical test that you uh, using the PLS SCM to evaluate in the set of predictive rel uh, rel uh, relationship is the root stepping procedure with sample set at five thousand. These statistics used to test the statistical significance of both outer model and the structural model. Now, results and discussion. This table shows the key sample characteristics. Most of them are male. Mean age was 48 years, then tertiary level education 8%, then average experience of the rubber farming was uh, 11 years. Then the uh, prominent call, uh, clone cultivated by them is RRI set one to one. Then average extent was for 0.4. Two stage building process here. These are the uh, tested uh, used. Then they are according to their basic criteria. Then those uh, test values for uh, are suit for the applicable for the uh, assessment of the structural model. Then uh, uh, SM, SMSR, NFI, and VIF they are, uh, fulfill their basic requirement. That's why this uh, assessment of the structural mo uh, model also can be applied for the hypothesis testing. Factors on the level of adoption of recommended SDTS. So nine hypotheses, all hypotheses, are significant at the 0.5 level. The R squared is 79%. Here, perceived usefulness, perceived ease of use, compatibility, relative advantage are affected with the attitude of rubber smaller towards the SDTS. So you can see here then uh, comparative. And compatibility effect is higher than the other three factors. It's very important for the extension person. Then the behavioral intention on the adoption of SDTS. Then subjective norm towards the SDTS. It's very important part factor uh, because uh, here uh, experienced rubber farmers and also the extension officers can play very uh, effective role for the change their behavioral intention. So then facilitating facilitating condition, especially for the tapping knives, then the, so tapping stencils, the knowledge of the tapping, then skill of the tapping, how to tap, then how to mark in those things. Those are very important for the under the facilitating conditions and perceived behavioral control towards the SDT is also affected to the uh, adoption so that uh, perceived, perceived behavioral control effect is comparatively higher than the behavioral intention for the adoption of SDTS. Then conclusion. So under this situation, so improving the favorable environment among the rubber small is monoragal is very important to improve the or enhance in the adoption of SDTS by Probably smallholder in Monorail. How we do it? So then extension services, especially in the rubber development department, rubber research institute of other private extension organizations, they have to uh, play key role in this process. They have to focus on these factors: perceived usefulness, perceived ease of use, compatibility, relative advantage, behavioral attention, attitude, subjective norms, facilitating condition, perceived behavioral control. How we improve those things? In their strategic uh, extension approaches. So not only that, then the further research would be useful to identify the additional variables, organizational structures. Then the, it may be and maybe policy changes. Those things. Then uh, extension personnel have played a play key role to uh, here to enhance in the adoption of SDTS by using those factors. These are the reference list of this study. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gunaratna, for your presentation. And uh, now the session is uh, open for discussion. If there are no questions from the uh, the audience, uh, let me move to the judges. Uh, judges, if you have any question from uh, Mr. Gunaratna. Uh, 
Okay, uh, can, I, can I ask? Yes, uh, Dr. Kamala. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the very nice presentation first. And uh, if, if I got you correct, um, I saw that uh, you mentioned you developed the pictures. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious to know about the validity. I mean, how the face validity was. I'm, I'm a bit curious about the validity and the reliability of these measures. I mean, did you did you check the uh, convergent validity, the construct validity, and the face validity and such things since you developed those measures on your own? I think I'm audible. Yes, we can hear you. Um, uh... Mr. Gundranda, would you like to respond to uh, Dr. Komodo's uh, comment question, please? Yeah, actually, uh, thank you for your question. Actually, we checked the uh, chronometer alpha uh, then the factor loading, uh, composite reliability, uh, covering the uh, convergent validity. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, AVE, uh, variance uh, inflation factor also measured. Then DOSA in the uh, 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 fulfill the basic requirement. Okay, so thank you very much. Just uh, one more question from you. Thank you. And I'm how will, and yes. I heard that uh, you went with the um, stratified sampling and how did that stratification work for you? The stratified sampling and uh, is my question clear? Uh, sorry, uh, sorry again. Yes, I heard that you it's went. Not clear. With your question is not clear. Yeah. Okay, so I heard that you went with the stratified sampling, and I'm just curious to know uh, on which basis you did the stratification, and did you see any differences in your model based on the uh, strata? I mean, the different strata that you that you used. Did you do kind of different models? So uh, yes, uh, we used the stratified random sampling technique, but. Uh, we didn't check the, that uh, uh, difference between that uh, those strata actually. Okay, thank you very much. That's all for my okay. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Talata or uh, Dr. Perra, no, you have any questions, please? Yeah, so it seems that uh, there are no questions. Uh, we have a little more time. Um, any question from the audience? We would like to get uh, at least one question from the audience, if you have. Yeah, seems uh, that there are no questions. So uh, let me now uh, move to the fourth uh, presentation of uh, this session. Uh, the title of the presentation is The Typology of uh, These Smallholding Development Societies assessing their multifunctional approach in Badula district of Sri Lanka. This paper is uh, co-authored by KGJP Mahindapala, MWAP Jayatilaka, LNAC Chavardana, A. Abe Surya, and N. Kamagi. So, so let us uh, first uh, play the presentation uh, by uh, KGJP Mahindapala. Have a nice day. Title of my presentation is the typology of these small holding development societies assessing their multifunctional approach in Badulla district of Sri Lanka. Let's start with the introduction. Farmer-based organizations were formed to tackle some of the basic issues faced by the small holding farmers. However, farm organization, particularly resource-oriented farm organization, are struggling to survive in the present economic context. Therefore, as a solution, multi-functional service approach was proposed. These small holdings development society are the farmer-based organization in the small holding sector. They were established by the government through a parliamentary act. Accordingly, 1,200 small holding societies are, were established in 1995 in small holding sector. They were expected to perform certain activities to improve the productivity, income, and status of the farmers. However, evidence shows that lack of improvement in the sector. Therefore, question comes that, is it due to lack of fulfillment of their task? Therefore, objective of this study is to assess the level of engagement of the small holding society in 12 identified activities in Badulla district 
and to categorize the these small holdings developed on societies according to their efficacy. Let's move on to the methodology. This is the conceptual frame of, of this study. Efficacy of these small holding development society is determined by the level of their the level of their involvement in several important activities illustrated here. In addition to the main survey, an opinion survey was also conducted to validate those activities illust illustrated in the conceptual framework and to estimate the relative importance with the support of 85 extension professionals. Research strategy of the main survey is cross-sectional survey with the structured interview. Pre-coded quest questions are, were included in the questionnaire and directed to the main officers of the society and their activities were assessed using 0 to 10 score scales. This is sampling technique. 154%, 140 uh, small holding development societies in Badulla district. Out of that, 21 these small holding development societies were selected from three startups. These startups was, was identified through a one of the pilot study held in previous. Data were analyzed using descriptive and inferential statistics and overall efficacy of the these small holding also estimated. Now we will see the results and discussion. Here I will show you the level of engagement of these small hole in different uh, development society in different activities. First, we look at the need identification of their members. Accordingly, as you can see, in the table, just only 40%, 48% of the these small hole in societies have involved satis satisfactory involved in identifying their members need and 38% of this small small holding societies were poorly involved in identifying their members needs when it's come to the ex extension activities none of the these small hold holdings development society had their own extension work therefore their role is mainly confined to linking the, their members to the ex existing extension service if you look at this chart Advisory and training activities have been poorly executed by 60% of the T small holding societies. And similarly, problem diagnostic and monitoring activity have been either poorly or very poorly executed by 80% of the T small holding society. If you look at the welfare activities available in the T small holding societies, it is good to notice that. 70% of the T small holdings society have at least one welfare scheme. Most common welfare scheme available was the debt donation scheme. However, certain T small holdings societies have more than one scheme, such as educational scheme, medical, recreation, and livelihood support. However, their in level of involvement is, was varied. If you if you come to the subject of Dealing with inputs, farm-based organizations should facilitate their members to access for a wider range of inputs. However, on, however, majority of the T small holdings societies poorly involved in supplying of the planting material to their members. In contrast with that, six, over 60% 60 of the T small holdings societies satisfactory involved in supplying the fertilizer and agrochemicals for their members and concessional trade. When it's come to the handling of primary produce processing and marketing, none of these small holding society involved in any form of value addition process, such as processing, product diversification, branding, and marketing of finished product. However, certain these small holding society success to engage in collection, collecting, collection of their members' crop. Accordingly, 43% of the T small holding societies were successfully in, in, involved in collecting their satisfactory involved in collect, collecting their members' crop. For that, they have collecting centers as well as field assistance to collect the crop. However, they have not tapped the potential of using these 
field assistant as a parallel extension workers. Now we will see the financial financial facilities available in the these small holding societies. As you can see in this chart, forty-three percent of the these small holding societies have involved in supplying of microcredits, and twenty percent, twenty-four percent of the these small holding society have involved in have shared their earned profits. However, only 5% of the T small holding societies have provided capital loans to their members. However, their involvement, overall in level of involvement, if you look at the overall level of involvement, just only 15% of the T small holding society achieve five level, five CO levels. If you look at the level of administrative function, adapted by the T small holding society here we have estimated number of meeting conducted accounting and accounting auditing and record keeping process in overall manner 62% of the T small holding societies have been, have successfully involved in these administrative activities however if you look at the some important aspects such as capacity building activities, dealing with natural resources, collective production and involvement in policy matters, they are poorly, they were poor, they, they poorly involved in these matters, it's especially when it comes to the collective production, there's no collective production activities taken place in this society, like when compared with the certain uh, farm organization in some other some of the other countries and when it come to the involvement in policy matters there's a lack of policy level dialogues taking place in their societies if you look at these results in different angle if the median value exceed statistically exceed five level with respect to the, these variables which we have discussed we can say this sample is performing well however this criteria is satisfied by only with respect to the one variable and therefore we can't say that this group these is more whole in development societies in Badu logistics not or in overall manner not performing well however this uh, this uh, explanation should give in segment wise therefore cluster analysis was performed and as you can see in dendrogram there were six clusters formed based on the level of involvement in multifunctional activities. As you can see in the GAN uh, table, the GAN, uh, when you look at the GAN center value, capacity building and other for profit activities were the least adapted practices. Cluster 5 and cluster 2 were the most performing cluster, which has three observations. And in addition to the init identification and administrative functions, several uh, variables received fairly good centroid values. Cluster 1 was the most least performing cluster which has eight observation if you when man within the test was performed to see the difference between these clusters there are significant difference was detected however the in some cases median value was less than four now we will see the overall efficacy of this these small holding society so far we have seen level, uh, the uh, involvement in dif uh, different uh, activities, le their le uh, level of involvement in different activities. However, all these activities may not equally important. So considering the relative importance of these activities, the e efficacy index was developed. You can, as you can see in this chart, huge, there are huge disparity between T small holding society with respect to the uh, overall index value. Uh, the, uh, in, uh, Societies that receive lowest index value comes under cluster one, and highest index value comes under cluster four and cluster cluster two and cluster five. The two question this poses two question: Why this higher variability occurs, and why they achieve lowest value? Ladies and gentlemen, let me summarize the findings. T small hole in development society in Badulla district shows the different level of execution of multifunctional service. They can be, accordingly, they can be categorized into six clusters. 
There's a lack of policy dialogues within the organization. The production support services are operated at unsatisfactory level except supply of inputs. Market-oriented activities are kept to a minimum level. In overall results imply that there is a shortfall of achieving the expected task by the key small holding society in Madhula district. Ladies and gentlemen, this, I have come, it, come to the end of my presentation. There, there may be some reasons behind these different typologies. They should be uncovered through the future research. Having said that, I will wind up my presentation while thanking the uh, support given by the TSHD official. Thank you very much for your patience with me. Thank you uh, indeed, uh, Mr. Mahindapala. Uh, so, uh, so let's uh, move to uh, the judges uh, to open up the discussion. Uh, yes. Yes, please. Can I, uh, can I ask? Yeah, yes. Please. Thank you very much. Yes, because I have just clarification. When uh, you mentioned the T small development societies, that you have mentioned several functions that and to, uh, that functions that is uh, who dis, uh, that are decided that functions it's not the collective what the members are asking oh that's a there's a set activities they have defined for the this uh, should be done by the 30 small holding societies is it clear my question yeah. yes clear uh, actually this uh, functions is, uh, was selected based on the literature particularly rondon and colling uh, suggested previously uh, some of the functions and these functions were validated by the uh, opinion survey uh, uh, then you said that the most of the functions that's uh, that uh, it's not uh, uh, very well and uh, do you think that uh, these the, these are the uh, things that expect these members are expecting from these three small holding societies? Yes, uh, actually, uh, when, uh, when if you look at the farm successful farm organization in the other countries, these are the functions uh, they are adapting, and uh, mm -hmm. in local conditions, there are these are the functions. Uh, adapted by some of the successful farm organizations. So uh, in, uh, in a broad sense, the, they, they have classified farm organization resource oriented and market oriented uh, in uh, the, the uh, according to the present uh, li uh, literature, the market oriented functions are uh, uh, benefited by the uh, most of the uh, members of the of farm organization. Yes. And in, in, in uh, there's one last, last question. Uh, is there any particular number uh, that number of members uh, belongs to that society, each society? Uh, no, madam. Uh, uh, that varies uh, from yeah. uh, 100, 100, uh, 100 to uh, uh, in Badulla area, uh, 100 to around uh, 500, 600. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Perraf, uh, are you available with us? Yeah. Uh uh, uh, uh yes, yeah professor Ekanaik, uh, uh, i have had serious problems so uh, we can hear you clearly please uh, raise your question <laughs> yeah we can hear you now uh, but unfortunately i, I wasn't able I to follow the uh, presentation that I is see. my problem so please go ahead with other people yes, uh, 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 would you like to uh, ask a question from uh, mr mahindapal so since there are no any questions uh, professor can i uh, yes. ask another one okay yes please yes, uh, yeah yeah, Mr. Mindwale, that do. Uh, what is the message you are given to the that's a uh, also yes, policy maker? Yes, madam. Is this is the uh, I mean uh, first part. Uh, it's a uh, yeah, ongoing research. It's the initial part of this research based mm -hmm. on this uh, variability of this uh, 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 society uh, farm organizations. Uh, we have to find uh, what. Uh, uh, factors uh, contribute to this uh, variability. So yeah, that it, it will be, uh, I mean, uh, 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 answered by the rest of the part of this, uh, I mean, future part of this study. Yeah, it's a research means that take another, uh, I think, uh, time. But uh, yeah. uh, before that, is there any simple message you can get uh, out of that study? Yeah, that uh, uh, I <clears throat> the the message I can give that uh, is that certain farm organizations are performing well, 
and certain farm organization are not performing well so that uh, there can be a reason for that uh, uh, for the uh, uh, that uh, for the uh, that uh, uh, variability is there any function you can uh, suggest to strengthen no whatever it's uh, out of these all these functions uh, i mean that we have to uh, uh, see that what uh, factors contributing whether it is uh, collective action or whether it is uh, leadership uh, issues or in, uh, uh, any other uh, issues we have uh, uh, we have to i mean investigate uh, uh, we have to in in investigate okay right thank you thank you thank you uh, thank you dr talata and uh, thanks uh, mr mahendra pala for your presentation so uh, now um, i would like i would like to uh, invite uh, for the fifth uh, presentation of the session the title of the presentation is partial integration of vegetable markets of sri lanka during covid 19 pandemic quoted by d m n j kumari j b rahewa and b m chandra the presenter is uh, uh, ms kumari so uh, so let us now uh, play the presentation This is my presentation on spatial integration of vegetable markets in Sri Lanka during COVID-19 pandemic. During this COVID-19 pandemic, agricultural markets in Sri Lanka were heavily disrupted and vegetable sector is no exemption. So because of these disruptions, price shocks were occurred in markets and government took a lot of actions to ensure these price shocks during the pandemic be perfectly transmitted from one market to another. So with this idea, the price transmission in agricultural markets is very important. So in agricultural economics perspective, the transmission of markets uh, through the various stages of supply chain or through horizontally related markets have long been concerned. This is mostly uh, through price linkages and typically concerned with spatial price relationships. So with that, the problem justification of this study is simply when a price shock take in one uh, location it will be perfectly transmitted to another location if and only two markets are integrated with each other it is uncertain whether price shocks during this pandemic were perfectly transmitted from one market to another due to supply and demand disruptions occurred hence the study of spatial market relationships provides the extent to which markets are related and efficient in price and during covid-19 pandemic so with that the uh, theoretical approach of this study is price transmission and market integration so the market integration is simplest meaning is that the vertically or spatially dispersed markets for a given commodity are connected by trade the extent to which markets make food available and accessible and keep price stable depends on the degree of market integration across a region therefore market integration often used as an indication of market efficiency So with that, the main objective of this study is to analyze the degree of market integration between Dambulla Dedicated Economic Centre, which is the main assembly point for vegetables of Sri Lanka and other regional vegetable markets in Sri Lanka before and during COVID-19 pandemic. To support that main objective, there were specific objectives in this study. First one is to uh, analyze the linear relationships between market pairs of the selected vegetables. and to estimate and test the long run equilibrium uh, relationships of prices and short run uh, price equilibrium among market pairs and finally to compare the market integration status before and during covid-19 pandemic so with that uh, the study um, reviewed most of the international literature and also uh, literature in sri lanka so in international literature most of the studies have used co integration approach and ravelian model to analyze this price transmissions and market integrations so one of the study uh, is integration among regional vegetable markets in indonesia uh, using co integration approach as well as another uh, research is uh, on potato markets and also grain markets using this co integration approach so when it comes to the uh, literature in sri lanka uh, one study is um, an economic analysis on spatial integration of regional rice markets in sri lanka so another market is testing market integration of sri lankan milk markets and also fish markets and finally um, there are many studies and uh, another study which is related to vegetable is spatial linkages of green chili prices between dedicated economic centers and regional um, markets of sri lanka using various methodologies with this uh, critical literature review 
of this study. Uh, this study used market co-integration uh, as the methodology. And this is a well-established uh, methodology in the literature and has been applied to various studies um, uh, of various market analysis. So co-integration is a technique used uh, to find possible correlation between uh, time series uh, processes in the long term and co-integration tests identified scenarios where two or more non-stationary uh, time series are integrated together in a way that they cannot deviate from equilibrium in the long term. So the most popular co-integration tests include co-integration uh, test of Engel Granger and Johansson test and Phillips Polaris test. And this study used Engel Granger co-integration test. So if we go to the methodology part, this consists of mainly two parts. One is test for COVID-19 period and the same test for pre-COVID-19 period. So the first test we used was simple bivariate correlation coefficients. So early research on market integration focused on measuring the co-movement of two price series in distinct markets. This is simply to uh, find out the linear relationship between uh, prices of markets. So this study used this one, but the main target of this study is to find out the co-integration status of market. Therefore, next we went to uh, do co-integration test. So the augmented Dicky fuller test was used before this co-integration uh, was done for uh, pre-COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 or the during COVID-19 periods. So uh, when it comes to ADF test, econometric analysis begins by checking the stationarity and non-stationarity of data. So for co-integration relationship, one of the assumption is that data must be integrated of uh, same order. So in this ADF test, uh, the null hypothesis was time series is showing non-stationarity and uh, the all negative hypothesis was time series is showing stationarity. So with that, uh, we went to market co-integration in two terms. The first one is long run market integration. That means long run equilibrium is one of, uh, one is which market prices are uh, constant over time, undisturbed by any uh, local stochastic effects. So we used Engel Granger co integration test to uh, test the long run market integration, while the uh, vector auto regression model and vector error correlation model to test the short run market integrations. So the data we used was uh, the wholesale prices for beans, tomato, carrots, and ginger. This map shows uh, the regional uh, economic centers or the vegetable markets that we use in this study, including Dumbledore and secondary data was extracted from Hardy database. And let's go for the results and discussion. So first one is the ADF test results, so the augmented Dickey Fuller test results for both COVID-19 and pre-COVID-19 period. So as this is the common test for these two periods, uh, I'll explain the results of this uh, first. So almost all the vegetables showed non-stationarity in uh, prices at level zero. And when it comes to the first difference series, uh, all the ADF statistics became statistically significant. This indicates that the series was stationary, the, uh, showing stationarity after the first difference. So let's go for the results of COVID-19 period and pre-COVID-19 period separately. So the uh, first thing is the test results for the COVID-19 period. The first what we did was uh, find out linear relationships between these uh, prices of the markets. There we could see in COVID-19 period, Vegetable markets do not show strong and positive correlations with the Muller dedicated economic center. Most of the correlation coefficients were um, lower than 0 0.7. And then uh, next, the main target of this study or the objective of this study is to find out the co-integration test results. So the long run co-integration uh, out of these 36 market pairs, market pair means in here we have considered the Muller and each of other markets. For example, Dambulla and Kalam, Dambulla and Tamutegam, Dambulla and Ampara market, likewise. So there are, out of 36 markets, only one market pair that was Dambulla and Dehi at the country was statistically significant at 5% critical level. So this implies that Dambulla and other markets for vegetables are not co-integrated with each other during COVID-19 pandemic in long run. So with that, we went to find out whether there are any co-integrations between these markets in short run. So there also we could see none of the uh, other markets uh, except Kalambu, Tabutega, Meguna and Nuvarili for beans were having short run co-integrations with Dambulla. So the next uh, result was for pre-COVID-19 period to compare uh, the uh, price relationships and the co-integration status with the uh, COVID-19 period. 
So they are also the same tests were done. First, the correlation matrices. So for that, the correlation coefficients of almost all the vegetable markets were showing um, the statistics uh, more than 0 0.7, implying that they are having strong and positive relationships between double prices um, before COVID-19. And next, the co-integration test results. They are also, interestingly, almost all the markets, that means 77% of the market pairs were showing co-integration status uh, in long run. Uh, that means it is in uh, before COVID-19 period. And uh, the vector correlation, error correlation model also showing the same results. Almost all the markets were showing a co-integration status between uh, Dambulla and other regional markets uh, before COVID-19 in short run. So this is the uh, results for pre-COVID-19 and during COVID-19 periods. These status, co-integration status, um, are different for each other. That means the COVID-19 and pre-COVID-19 period. That means in pre-COVID-19 period, almost all the markets were co-integrated with each other, either long run or short run, but not like uh, COVID-19 period. So the conclusion is, for pre-COVID-19 period, the linear price linkages between Damulla and almost all the markets were showing strong relationships, as well as the co-integrated with each other. But when it comes to the COVID-19 period, the linear price linkages between Damulla and almost all the markets were not showing strong relationships. And during the pandemic, Tambut Tegma, Meguda, Kalambu, Norelli, and Dehiyatakandi markets were co-integrated with Damulla only for beans. And um, however, in long run, only one market was co-integrated with Dambulla in uh, COVID-19 period, that was Dehiyatakandi. And the possible reasons for all these non-co-integrated behavior of markets during the COVID-19 pandemic may be due to the supply and demand side interruptions occurred during the pandemic. So the results clearly indicate that even though the government imposed various protective measures to keep the vegetable supply chain resilient during this COVID-19 pandemic, the price transmission has not happened effectively between markets. So these were the references that I used for this study. And thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Kumar, for the presentation. Now. Uh, the forum is uh, open for discussion. Uh, just uh, once again, a quick reminder, if uh, audience, if you have any question, please post on uh, the chat box. And now I would like to move to the, uh, the judges. Um, whoever want to speak, uh, please ask questions. Right. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, Dr. sorry. <laughs> this is one occasion where I heard the entire presentation. So, Right. Uh, so this is a very interesting subject that you have embarked on. Congratulations on tackling this issue, because you know, uh, as you know, uh, today these days you know uh, the prices of all vegetables is sky high. Uh, that uh, is undeniable. So my question is, uh, you indicate that uh, uh, the nonlinearity uh, occurs due to supply and demand uh, functions in operation. But I believe it has more to do with um, transport uh, during COVID period. During COVID period, uh, the transport problem really came to a head. And uh, can you hear me, madam? Hello? Yes, Hello? Okay. Oh, okay, right. Uh, how, what, what would be your response? Is it due to supply demand situ function situations or is it due to the prices change due to transport difficulties and associated problems? I mean, logistic problems. Yes, sir. thank you for the question. Actually, uh, this transportation uh, issue is also uh, in the supply uh, side. That means I thought that uh, the supply side interruptions include all these uh, logistic uh, issues as well as the uh, issues related with the uh, production or the um, uh, accumulation of these vegetables in various places uh, without transporters and like those uh, issues are related with the uh, whole supply side uh, problem in this case. So what are your suggestions if uh, you were to uh, you were approached by a politician of the prevailing government uh, to give recommendations about how to resolve these issues what would be your response? 
Yes, sir. Uh, actually, uh, the response will be, uh, we know that uh, in this COVID-19 period, the government did a lot of actions, uh, short-term measures to um, mitigate the uh, negative impacts of this COVID-19. So especially we saw that the procurement program, the vegetable procurement program, the government uh, bought uh, the uh, vegetables from the farmers and they were trying to uh, mitigate the uh, negative consequences. So, but uh, the thing is that if that uh, program happens well uh, and strategically, this kind of uh, interruption will not happen. So I think um, in that manner, the uh, procurement program, let's say, it should be uh, focused on specific locations. That means for an example, let's say that uh, any area that produces uh, some kind of vegetable so the government uh, or any kind of uh, party should go there and buy that vegetable directly from those farmers not uh, ad hocly that means uh, there should be policies like short term or long term uh, those uh, parties should go to directly to the uh, right place to uh, buy vegetables uh, for direct uh, buying or anything so i think uh, the strategic measures should be there other than ad hoc uh, measures but during this covid 19 it may be these ad hoc uh, measures may be due to the interruptions happen here and there and uh, but it should be happen in a very strategic manner in uh, long Okay, how about a, a market intelligence system is it would it be important uh, so that um, uh, the prices which are there in uh, Migoda market or Dambulla market, would they uh, rise or fall uh, in unison? Or is I couldn't. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I mean, say for example, uh, uh, the uh, say for example, if there's a market uh, uh, closer to the producers, then there are there are markets uh, in Colombo. So. Uh, would there be a need for a uh, well-established market in, uh, uh, intelligence system in operation so that you know, prices uh, would not be uh, determined by various um, external forces? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, that should be a long-term measure. And um, I think that should be gradually uh, developed. Uh, that means whole vegetable supply chain should be uh, developed in that manner. So uh, all the uh, vegetable network, uh, that means Dambulla is the uh, main vegetable hub and all the other uh, regional markets should be um, integrated with each other like a network and there are price transmissions and all these things should be uh, happened in a very smooth and consistent manner. And uh, that only uh, can be done if there's a very good established uh, supply chain, uh, okay. actually. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Thank thanks you. Uh, Dr. Berla, because we ran out of time. For this. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, no, no, you're all right. Thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Kumari, for your responses. So now we have come to the, uh, the final uh, presentation of uh, our session. Uh, the title of the presentation is Strengthening the Livelihood resilience of smallholder dairy farmers against external shocks in the north dry zone of Sri Lanka, co-authored by S. Prasad and K. Uma Shankar. And the presenter is S. Prasad. Now we'll uh, be playing the presentation. I would like to begin my presentation from here. Most of the protein requirement of the people in the world fulfilled by the milk and milk products. Thus, there is a strong demand for the milk because of increasing populations. As you know, uh, some countries are self-sufficient in their production. Some countries import milk and milk product from other countries. In Sri Lanka, dairy production only meets around 40% of the local requirement. You may wonder that around 50 billion worth of milk and milk products we are importing annually. Hence, there is an urgent requirement to give up boost to the national production in order to fulfill the local demand. I would like to post some a prominent news and article which are published in various uh, papers and articles. Sri Lanka, far away from achieving milk self-sufficiency, 
because farmers facing many challenges in a different agroecological zone. Especially rice on farmers face more than uh, their ecological zones in Sri Lanka. Especially poor genetic makeup, low productivity, limited availability of partial land, lack of knowledge in improved farming practices technology, mostly part-time farmers, fresh water scarcity is the main challenge for the rice on farmers. In addition to that, this COVID pandemic is the big challenge to develop our local production. Anyhow, the COVID impact and import deficit also reduce the environment to the dairy sector to the improvement. I have chosen my research title, Strengthening the Livelihood Resilience of the Smallholder Dairy Farmers Against External Shock in the Northern Rhizome of Sri Lanka. You know that improve the livelihood resilience will improve the local productions. Uh, normally, enhanced performance and production of the dairy is attained by the two parties. One is adoption of capital intensive technology. We can say New Zealand and Australia, these are uh, capitalized countries. But when uh, concern adoption of capital intensive technology, practically it's not possible for Sri Lankan context. So we can increase our uh, production uh, by improving the livelihood resilience of the farmers. This is the best way to enhance the performance and production of the dairy. I have formulated the following research objectives. So first one is report the current status of the livelihood resilience of the Yakna district dairy farming households to an external shock for instance, the COVID-19 pandemic. Second one is find out the correlation between the livelihood resilience of the dairy farmers and its latent variable, namely income and food access, access to residential services, social safety net, assets, adaptive capacity, and stability of the particular dairy farmer in the Yapna district. Third one is find out the determinants that influence the livelihood resilience of the dairy farmers in the Yapna district. Final one is address any gender influence on the livelihood resilience of the dairy farmers in the Yapna district. In methodology, Yapna district, of course, our study area, target population is smallholder dairy farmers who are having herd size 6 to 10. Stratified purposive random sampling was used. Here, this uh, segment highlighted uh, one is our sampling segment. Less than five is not stable. We were not taken for the our study purpose because they are not stable. Sometimes they have a four, sometimes they have three in herd size. Uh, but greater than 10 is less sample size. Uh, anyhow, if it's good proper uh, effort and appropriate measures, then it could be more possible to push uh, their segment to the successful uh, dairy unit. Primary data and secondary data sources were used for the data collections. 219 dairy farmers were chosen after removal of outliers. Effective sample size was 203. I have involved in two time period uh, in 2016 and 2020 to gather the information from same household. So, in look at the conceptual framework, you know that uh, dairy sector, the performance of uh, sector normally influenced by the socioeconomic factors and environmental factors and challenges. Any shock or adverse in the factors will expect to have the consequences on their performance. When, do you, uh, when we face that unfavorable condition or shock or any adversarial effect, farmers uh, have to have improved their livelihood resilience through these latent variables. So then only they can increase the productivity and cumulative milk production. Structural equation model was used. Livelihood resilience is the function of latent variable. Uh, each and every latent variable function of observable variables. Data were analyzed analysis uh, using the econometric software data 13.1. If you look at the results and discussion, this is the uh, out summary of the uh, structural equation model. This is the standard evidence for an existing of a significant relationship between the livelihood resilience and their latent variable. Here, dietary diversity is the significant variable. In under the latent variable, access to the basic services, quality of health services, and uh, under the social safety net, 
frequency of assistance as well as quality evaluation of assistance are significant. In asset land owned is the significant variables. Here, education is the significant observable variables. Here, the number of job loss is the significant variable under the uh, latent variable of stability. Dietary diversity, quality of health services, frequency of assistance, quality evaluation of assistance, land loan, education level, and number of household uh, members lost their jobs displayed a significant positive relationship with their latent variables. Based on the significant variables, we came up with the recommendations. Uh, here, important of the dietary diversity in their regular meals have to be insisted. All the essential nutrition should be made available to them. How we are going to ensure that it should be available to them and accessible to them based on the local context. Top of all of it, create awareness to them how they can be done simply through the extension services. Quality of uh, health services. Health of farmer is one of the important aspect of the dairy sector to uplift their production. But veterinary officers only focus the health of dairy animals, don't think about the farmers' health. That's why our system is very good. Again, quality of health services should be available and they have to access and affordable for that. Social safety net program generally protect from farm families from the impact of shock. Regular direct cash flow or transfer program and a real support during this crisis time by government will protect the family. Frequency of assistance as well as the quality of assistance are important during the pandemic or shock tag. Land on, on also significantly correlate to the uh, latent variable asset. Uh, land is actually, this has to be considered as the proxy for the having the access to the land for their production purpose. Land accessibility to be increased, uh, for example, a support to the established common partial land in the ancient every weather division. This is held to they have increased their access to their partial land. This is also exercise to the animal. Another way of increasing the accessibility of the land could be uh, guiding and advising the farmers to make up of their own land efficiency. We can say, example, coconut plantation, they can plant partial for, uh, for our plants. The education, the formal education is not possible because of the age group of state farmers. So we can provide technical knowledge through these uh, informal education like uh, training programs or being the consultant and provide technical knowledge in silage feeding, urea related store feeding, solar feeding, and uh, for a grass cultivation. These kind of uh, some knowledge, if they, uh, if you provide to farmers, then they would be able to increase their local production. If you look at the general influence on the performance of the dairy industry in Japan district, when we are involved, these are data collection, around 40% of the uh, samples were uh, female. So that comes from the interaction between uh, gender education and uh, average milk age. Uh, unlike uh, male uh, dairy farmers, of Females, when education level is increasing, their performance is decreased. Female twofold responsibility that is uh, commitment towards the family. So far, female with high education have been uh, end up with the low uh, milk yield. Uh, this is quite interesting. We found that uh, when females education increasing, they downsize in their third size. This is uh, reason for getting low milk yield. Due to their family commitment, female farmers may be maintaining smaller size than male. When the land holding size is increasing, yield difference becomes narrower between male and female. This reveals that uh, gender influence in the yield can be minimized with the uh, increasing access to the land. Uh, number of household health members lost their job actually positively correlated to, to the stability. Loss of employment by a household member had strengthened their livelihood resilience because uh, motivated and uh, compelled to re orient themselves to the dairy business. Any support that would strengthen a farmer business and will lead to sustainable dairy farming and higher income. 
shortcoming in this uh, research, uh, maybe if you couldn't reach the same household at a different time period, but unfortunately, some of the samples were dropped, possibly due to the household decision to give up dairy farming or downsize the bread size. In here, first pillar known as uh, income and food access was dropped uh, from the model. That's uh, we assume that uh, income and food access also significantly correlate with the livelihood residents of the dairy farms. A suggestion for the future research uh, to get a complete picture uh, suggest a supplement research and build the relationship between livelihood residents and its uh, correlation with the technical adaptation. With that, I am uh, concluded my uh, presentation. On whole, the study results could be used to develop a policy framework that involved or increase the livelihood resilience of the dairy farmers in the Afghan district as well as a by zone. Thank you. Good morning to you all. I would like to thank you, uh, Mr. Prasad, for your presentation. Now, uh, the session is open for discussion. Uh, any questions from the uh, judges, please? I think this is directly in line with Dr. Talata's uh, expertise. Ah, yes, uh, Dr. Talata, we would like to uh, get the first uh, question from you, please. Yes, Professor, just uh, so thank you. And I want to ask one question. The uh, first question is, is this, uh, you studied this, uh, all these farmers, you, you mentioned that it is not possible to educate them or something. Is there any particular age group? You mentioned that farmers means old, old people. No, um, yeah, uh, not all the, uh, the uh, people are in the age group, but uh, the variation is there. There, there are different group of peoples, but mostly uh, they are age group. That's why uh, we cannot uh, provide that formal education. That's why we can improve their knowledge through the uh, informal education, like uh, extension services, likewise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In the first slide, you that I mentioned that uh, because of that. Uh, uh, indigenous species and other things that uh, low production is there. Yeah, I do. I'm. I don't agree with that because uh, there are so many. Uh, that's a uh, upgrade in uh, that uh, work has been done, and I think mostly there's a not that problem. I think. Yeah, but uh, yeah. from our observation in uh, Yapna district, uh, you can uh, see, uh, but uh, most of the farmers, they are improving their uh, herd size from their indigenous breeds. But uh, since uh, they are adapted for this uh, artificial insemination and everything, so the yes. last uh, two years, three years uh, intensively. Mm -hmm. Because we, uh, this is a mostly resettled area. That's why they couldn't get those uh, facilities uh, before that. So now they are uh, involved and in getting these uh, those services and they are upgrading uh, their breeds. The mostly they have indigenous, but they uh, they have a considerable uh, mix of uh, cross breeds with them. Yeah. Uh, what about the feeding and other things patterns? Have you studied? Yeah, uh, feeding also they are normally allowed to partial land and uh, uh, likewise they, they keep as the semi intensive systems. Uh, not uh, fully intensive uh, uh, system because of this uh, uh, availability of the grassland and other things. That's why uh, they allow to uh, outside. And so nowadays uh, they are improving their feeding with the Asola and uh, dry Russian uh, likewise. Yeah, they have improved. Okay, 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 thank you. Thank you, Dr. Talata. Uh, Dr. Berra, you have any questions from? Uh, just one question. Yes. Uh, there, did you note any relationship between land holding size and uh, productivity in dairy farming? Yeah, yes. Uh, there's a, re a relationship between the land holding capacity and their milk yield. So, both the male and female, they are getting. Uh, uh, milk yield uh, with the increasing uh, uh, land size or the uh, access to the their uh, uh, land size. So, but in uh, later part, if you increase the more accessible to the uh, land, uh, we can uh, see that uh, I show it in in uh, one uh, graph in this uh, presentation also. The difference between the milk yield will be narrow with the uh, higher um, access to the land. Mm -hmm. That's why they are. Uh, no gender yeah, variation. Oh, if you have the more access, they can uh, get uh, a similar yield from yeah, both just, sides. Uh, just tell me, uh, considering the frequency distribution of herd size, herd size, which is the most frequent one, five to six? 
Yeah, five to six, but uh, we received uh, different, uh, some outliers also. No, what That's I mean is, you know, that would have clearly five. clarified the point to us. Uh, to yeah. I mean to have presented the frequency distribution uh, based on free, uh, herd size that would have clearly indicated the kind of sample that you are dealing with because there may be uh, people who are capable of intensive uh, 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 animal husbandry whereas there would be others uh, who would basically be subsisting only so you have to take that also into your consideration in doing future research the yeah, moment definitely. you talk about Azola, then the question arose in my mind, are all the small scale farmers using Azola and various other techniques? Are they using, you know, uh, urea impregnated uh, straw and other things? Uh, I mean, these are technologies which are known from ages, but are they using it? Uh, that is the, uh, that, that's an important issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your thank comment. You, thank uh, you, Dr. Perra. And thank you. I think uh, we have uh, come to the end uh, and uh, uh, in, in this session, uh, um, in fact, uh, we had a very comprehensive session uh, covering uh, many aspects of uh, uh, agriculture uh, processes, uh, uh, including uh, we got uh, uh, dietary diversity, fisheries, uh, tea, rubber, or vegetable markets, and uh, finally the uh, dairy farming. And uh, um, we had a very uh, good uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, I must thank the, the uh, judges uh, for their very, uh, very valid, uh, constructive questions we got. Uh, so on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Talata Ratnayak, a former additional director general, livestock department, department of animal production and health. Okay, and Dr. You. Kumudu uh, Chayabarthana, Senior Lecturer, Department of Management uh, Sciences, uh, Faculty of Management from OLS University, and uh, Dr. B. M. K. Pereira, former uh, Director of the Career Guidance Unit of the University of Peradeh. Uh, and also, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Pradeepa Korlegedara, uh, the, the uh, session coordinator for excellent coordination. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pradeep. And also, I would like to thank uh, the technical staff uh, who involved uh, uh, in, in this session. Thanks uh, for uh, both of them also. And um, I would also uh, like to thank the presenters uh, for, for their presentation. And I'm sure the, the, the feedback that you got from the judges um, uh, will be useful for you to uh, make your papers uh, into publishable level. And even though we did not get any questions from the audience um, uh, through all the session, we got a good uh, number, uh, number audience. I'm sure you have been benefited uh, uh, by listening to uh, these uh, six uh, presentations. So with that remark, anything to be added, uh, Dr. Pradeepa? Uh, no, sir, that's all. Thank you very much for sharing the sessions in a very fruitful way. And thank you very much for accepting our invitation. So I also would like to thank our uh, judges, Dr. Kumudu Chayavadare, Dr. Tarata Rupasekar, and Dr. BMK Pereira for accepting our invitation and providing feedback to all our presenters. I'm sure our presenters will benefit from these comments and they will improve their studies. And again, I wanted to thank all our presenters and the authors of the papers for choosing PGIA Congress as a platform to disseminate their research findings. Congratulations to all of you. Last but not least, I would like to thank all our audience for joining with us. So I would like to wind up the sessions with an invitation and a video. So the video will be an introduction to the Board of Studies of the Postgraduate Institute of Agriculture. As a pioneer in providing postgraduate education to Sri Lanka, PGIA is offering 31 uh, programs in different disciplines. So the video will introduce you to this degree program. And uh, my invitation is about the invited speech, invited presentation that we have. So Professor Diane Beckles from the University of California Davis will do her invited presentation at 1.30 p.m. So we will invite you to join the session through the Zoom link provided for the main event. So thank you very much for joining with us.
Thank you very much for joining with us. We will again meet at 1.30. Have a nice day.